All right, I'm going to get rolling with an introduction here. Um, and I imagine we'll have folks continue to join as we go. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. My name is Liberty, and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. And today we're excited to be hosting author Xander Dunlop in conversation with translator Carlos Tornell. Xander's new book, uh, The System is Killing Us, Land Grabbing, the Green Economy, and Ecological Conflict, uh, examines the catastrophic effects of energy infrastructure and mining on communities, their land, and our, uh, and our planet. Uh, Firestorm's an almost 16-year-old radical bookstore uh, owned and operated by a queer feminist collective in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. Uh, we're striving to feature books and events that reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized communities in the South. And we're continuing to do virtual events uh, like the one today, um, both because there are folks in our community for whom uh, virtual is more accessible, and also uh, because it gives us an opportunity to connect with people at a distance, which is a real pleasure. I was just saying before we started, uh, it's always cool to be able to do an author event where we've got folks um, joining from across borders um, and oceans. So here we are. In the next week, uh, we've got a few other virtual events happening. Um, we'll be hosting uh, Lizette Wenzer, um, author of Trauma, Trusses, and Truth, to discuss the surveillance and subjugation of Black women's hair. Um, and we'll be hosting anarchist authors Charlie Allison and Zoe Baker, uh, to discuss their respective books on anarchism in the early 20th century. Uh, so if you're interested in either of those or just want to keep in touch, uh, you can follow us on social media or uh, join our newsletter, and I'll share a link in the chat. So uh, tonight, today, we are uh, using uh, Zoom's Q&A tool. If you're not familiar with it, it's probably at the bottom of your screen, and it's kind of a a mechanism for sharing questions um, or kind of talking back. So we definitely love to hear from you and uh, please feel free to just write out questions as we go. I know we've got some time set aside at the end specifically for Q&A, but it's always nice to have a, a little bit of a cue. So when we get there, um, we can jump right in and we'll get started. So uh, as I mentioned, we've got Xander and Carlos here today. Xander Dunlap is a post-doctoral uh, research fellow at Boston University and a visiting uh, research fellow in the Global Development Studies Department at University of Helsinki in Finland. Their work has critically examined police military transformations, market-based uh, conservation, wind energy development, and extractive projects more generally in Latin America, Europe, and the United States. They've written numerous books and are a longtime participant in anti-police, squatting, and environmental movements. Carlos Tornell is a writer, researcher, translator, and activist in Mexico City. He holds a PhD in human geography from Durham University in the UK. And his work has focused on the politicization of the climate crisis, the decolonization of energy justice and uh, transitions, and the ontological openings created by, by uh, pluriversal struggles in Mexico. Uh, Carlos is part of the Global Tapestries of Alternatives. Um, so thanks to both of y'all for joining us today. Uh, I know this is gonna be a great conversation on a topic that's really important. Um, so big appreciation. And I'll go ahead and pass it off to Xander. All right, thanks so much, Liberty. I'm really grateful for you to organizing this and also Firestorm Books for just pulling it down for almost 16 years and, and hosting this event, I really appreciate it. But yeah, I got a bit of a long presentation. We got some things to get into, we got some stuff to talk about. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's get into it. I, there's actually a good amount of housekeeping that we got to get into before this my presentations this year and probably forever even implicitly are dedicated to Alfredo and Bonanno and Cleve and Ali. Uh, I'm hoping in a space like this these people are well known and you, normally I'm in university environments where they're not. As everyone knows Alfredo and Bonanno we could argu arguably say is one of the most important anarchist theorists. It's definitely contemporary but maybe even in general in terms of the work they've done and they've been in it as you can see for a very long time and not only are they an important anarchist theorist but of course practitioner and if you 
I, I really hope everyone is well acquainted with Alfredo here. But uh, if you're not, he's someone who, you know, at age 73 or 72 was uh, caught robbing banks in Greece. You know, so he was someone who was uh, a man of action, you can say. And also recently and unfortunately kind of... Uh, you know, meeting the statistics for Diné and, and Navajo Nation, kind of life expectancy. Klee Benali, an, an amazing, an amazing theorist, and also someone who's been so important in actually combining and really showing how Diné practices of, yeah, Diné practices of anarchy resonate with, uh, with anarchism and anarchist ideas and struggle, but really mixing and showing the importance of actually Diné cosmology and struggle and ways and really connecting to the, the spirituality and importance of connecting with different landscapes, excuse me, not even landscapes, but different habitats in terms of fighting and, and has published and done so many important things under their name and not in terms of advancing struggle in Turtle Island or yeah, occupied Turtle Island. Uh, and still more, you know, and it's for me and, and what a lot of this book we'll get into in a moment, you know, right now academia is full to the brim with people being activists, caring about stuff, fighting something, decolonial this. Again, Klee, an amazing critic of what's going on in the academy, the decolonial academy and, and what it actually does. But right now, you know, Toby Schoen is in, is in prison in the UK for being, I mean, ultimately they're in prison and being tortured because of suspecting of actually publishing different communiques, part of the 325 magazine. But but have actually defeated their kind of terrorism charges and, and were just taken in on, on having kind of ultimately different kind of uh, illegal medicines that are deemed illegal by the state and, and also, and they were a, a cancer survivor. And I, I just want to highlight and give a shout out for Toby, who's been kind of the last three years struggling under horrible circumstances and, and yeah, and ultimately just for being suspected of publishing different kind of uh, anarchist communiques and kind of heavy action stuff. And I just want to push everyone to check out the recent, relatively recent kind of final straw episode that kind of gives you a breakdown and an update on that. So yeah, look into that, talk about it, you know, the kind of the kind of the totalitarian drift in K, but also elsewhere is a serious concern for everyone and affects everyone. And I hope that that can be lines of solidarity and struggle against the prisons and this type of repression. So, okay, an outline. Time to talk about a book. And playing academia, which I do, means we got to offer you an outline and tell you where we're going to go and how's it going to be. And so really, I'm going to just kind of talk about, you know, what kind of triggered the book, where it comes from. I'm going to give you the fastest breakdown I can of kind of what's in the book. Just give you a little sample to encourage you to to buy the book, hopefully from Firestorm or other radical and independent bookstores. And, and as you know, my meager seven or 9% royalties goes to the, the Atlanta Solidarity Fund. And that will be paid out to them annually for the duration and existence of this book. And then I wanna actually talk about some things that are, are really wearing on me that I, I think I wanna stress and kind of as a more kind of movement conversation here. Let's get into it. This book is more or less the result of me being completely dissatisfied, if not insulted by what's going on in the kind of the popular academic publishing or in like the left academic publishing. I'm looking at Pluto, I'm looking at Verso, and, and really just the general kind of popular conversation that extends past them in terms of ecological crisis, climate change. Oh, what are we going to do? We had Greta coming out in 2017, made this huge push. We got climate youth. And there became this whole kind of big public relations revival of, uh, and not to mention, you know, we have Al Gore earlier and not to mention his climate youth training schools that have been kind of really pushing this issue of climate change and to talk about these things. And yes, of course, a really important concern, but like, what is the conversation and what are we having? And the way I look at it is we more or less have Green New Deal, ecological authoritarians, degrowth, and where I'm throwing my hat, the anarchist approach to these things, which gets a lot less kind of mainstream media attention. And yeah, I think we should all know by now, I hope, about the Green New Deal. It's just an eco-modernist program. It's just like the Green, just like the New Deal after World War II. This is a way to kind of reinforce the state, redistribute funds, and to really just advance capitalism, market, and state relations. And with the, the promise of 
degrading the environment less or doing it in a more friendly and sustainable development kind of way. Whether that's really the case is completely questionable. And that's something we'll we'll talk about later. But yeah, the Green New Deal is nothing more than than just kind of revamping the existing and opening up green capitalist markets and hopefully inviting a green transition to roll out as many low carbon infrastructures known as wind, solar, energy infrastructures, digital smart technologies, greening the mining processes that go into this. And, and we'll talk about that. But long story short, while a lot of people, degrowthers included, were all excited about all the change that would come from this, already in Europe, there's something called the European Green Deal that uh, that's more or less, more or less ex continuing and exaggerating the existing this time just under green and opening green markets. And this is something you can read about in the book, specifically in Southern France and, and on the Iberian Peninsula, with also with Portugal and more mining, which we'll talk about briefly. So yeah, we got the same kind of liberal democratic, neoliberal environmentalism being pushed out through the Green New Deal. And then what do we have next? Yeah, good old Verso over there and, and a lot of the other radical left publishers, they're, they're throwing their hat behind ecological authoritarians who are saying, Fuck degrowthers. We need more. We need socialist modernism. We need to have a hard, firm state who's going to come down and and you know regulate our way out of ecological crisis. Nice idea. I think we all want to believe in this. We'd love to have Papa come in and you know right all the wrongs in the world. And I guess uh, yeah, this is the kind of the big man patriarchal kind of big man leader kind of story we've always heard. The state's going to come in. There's going to be a great leader who's going to fix these things. And needless to say, I, I think that's a garbage idea. I also don't think it's realistic. But as the kind of introduction to the book talks about, you've got, you can roughly, and this is crude, you know, you've got a soft ecological authoritarians that ultimately just, in the end, despite class rhetoric and engaging in kind of inaccessible Marxian jargon, they ultimately are just trying to expand a Green New Deal, advance, really kind of support the working class as an agent of change. And, you know, trying to develop a voting base that, you know, the degrowther in that position and that type of, quote, austerity is not attractive to. But in the end, it's it's really actually just trying to reinforce kind of democratic principles, see the working class as an agent and change in moving that. And, and, and in many ways, admirable. Like, these, there's definitely kind of lines and, and wanting to hope of, of workers actually wanting to challenge and question these things and to move away from kind of toxic lifestyles, whether that's in factories or the pastimes that are so common, say, in the United States or Euro-America. More concerning, which I guess there's been a number of pamphlets coming out of kind of the anarchist milieu, but for some reason, I don't know why there aren't more political ecologists up in arms about some of this stuff, is that there's people kind of advocating ecological Leninism. Um, again, uh, concerning stuff here in terms of, you know, Lenin is actually being viewed as, uh, in that time, the Bolshevik kind of coup d'etat, some say the, so the Soviet revolution, that this is actually an admirable period of time of, of what we should mimic and that we should have a big strong ruler who's gonna come in and put on these authoritarian measures like this. But yeah, I mean, what's strange about this is that somehow it's acceptable to have someone, I mean, it really comes down to what you know about Lenin. And if you're coming from an anti-authoritarian Marxist or anarchist perspective, you're most certainly not going to appreciate the way that the gulag system was set up under them and the way that in August, I believe it, Barry Paintman, he's someone you should look into. And there's a great book called Bloodstains that's an edited volume of kind of primary resources and, and kind of reflected resources about the way anarchists and so many people were executed and suppressed, not to mention Lenin's terror. So kind of the violent kind of internment and kind of the high modernist ideology, even Rosa Luxemburg was arguing with Lenin about kind of forging through these kind of industrial programs and ultimately this vanguard authoritarianism that was ultimately violent, created their own secret police. And I don't know if creating a secret police to enforce and stop ecological climate change, to stop the climate change and ecological catastrophe is actually really a realistic way. One, it, it really ignores the amount of people that are already working within this system and trying to do things. And it's also not reflecting on the realities of armed struggle and actually how to do this. So again, a lot of this seems like a almost like a cynical academic exercise that and that no surprise is actually disparaging to eco anarchists and so many other people who are kind of in struggle doing everything they can to beat back the kind of the spread of these infrastructures and capitalism. So yeah, completely disappointed there. And then degrowth. In the end, this book is an advocate of degrowth. 
I think degrowth is a. Uh, I think a lot of things about degrowth, and uh, but overall, I think the idea of actually reducing material and energy throughput, really like degrowing, the kind of extra extractivism in a sense, but more importantly, finding ways to actually improve and to live in balance with our ecosystems and actually make life better and create new possibilities. And I think degrowth is the more mainstream way that's gotten a huge thrust and excitement in academia, slowly making its way into policy circles and big funding schemes and grants in, the, in Europe. And I think in terms of a mainstream way, there, there's, actually, there's actually hope of actually challenging capitalism and beating this back. However, it's rather disconnected from movements. It likes to call itself a movement, but hasn't actually treated autonomous land defense struggles very well, let alone even acknowledged it in academic literature, which is something I've decried for a, year, a couple of years, three or four years now. And so why well, advocate degrowth? Mostly because eco-anarchists, anarchists and eco-socialists have been advocating these things for a century or two. It's it's just kind of a rebranding and, and there's a risk of this being a kind of a technocratic rebranding that's not trying to address kind of more issues of power. Um, and of course, the anarchist approach, which this book really extends, which implicitly has a degrowth approach in it. You know, this this book comes as kind of almost a companion or complementary extension of Peter Gelderloos's book, The Solutions Are Already Here, that is also kind of putting its, throwing its hat behind this. And I, and I think in that book, it's great, actually, the last chapter and how it's actually imagining different ways and the futures that we want to live in. And I think there's some important stuff in there. But in the end, this book, based on a lot of different experience the last 10 years, is actually really advocating a kind of decentralized, viral, and anti-authoritarian approach to, to struggle. And it's really trying to say, like, if hey, if, big if, if we really want to challenge capitalism, if we really want to roll this stuff back, we want to challenge the state, we're going to have to do this ourselves. You know, the whole history and track record of states saying they're going to change things, ideas of big politicians or leaders who are going to forcefully somehow save the environment. Like that's that's not cutting it. We're going to have to do these things. We're going to have to we're going to have to act local and think global and we're going to have to develop networks and work in various levels of of accompliship and solidarity and critical solidarity, often with actors we don't like to make these things happen. But this is to say and this approach in this book is to really say that now's the time thinking of Bonanno to engage in permanent ecological conflict, however you want to imagine that and do that. And really, I think the most important thing here is how to, to connect that between people. But in short, the purpose of the system is killing us is to really, is to reflect on 10 years of my work, working on different energy infrastructure mines and the different kind of anarchistic and autonomous movements struggling and fighting against them. And, I'm going to run you through some of those sites really as fast as I can. If you want to, if you want to know more about it, read the book, check it out. You can maybe even find some kind of open access articles about some of this work that I've done. But yeah, in short, this book hopefully is is a way to kind of push against these kind of mainstream tendencies that I find so tiring, so boring, and so depressing in terms of like where the conversation is at. And hopefully we can push and make this a bit more interesting. So we got Carlos down in Mexico City. I spent, I already have another book called Renewing Destruction that really looked at my PhD of living in a lightly armed, I ultimately lived in a, a lightly armed police communitaria that was fighting to protect their, their lagoon and their land from the invasion of wind turbines. Uh, I looked at an area, you can see the star at the top, the, an area that was like 70, 80% surrounded. I mean, now it's, now it's like 90% surrounded by wind turbines, like towns surrounded up to 250 and up to 500 meters. So people's houses are engulfed by energy infrastructure and wind turbines. The Bihiosho Wind Park, the first built on the lagoon, was built through hardcore repression, paramilitaries, assassination, barricade fighting, prisoner exchanges during these kind of 24-hour kind of fights to force through the project. And ultimately, also not only not only this kind of hard repression with paramilitaries, riot police, but also, but also social development and this way of using kind of the carrot to try to pay people off, to buy communities, and in, in a sense, just kind of textbook counterinsurgency tactics. And then the third, and then the star where I lived was a, is a village that rose up, took over the town hall, and expropriated a police truck, an ambulance, and a dump truck, and began a project of indigenous autonomy 
to actually protect the bar de Santa Teresa, which is that long bar where they wanted to build a hundred turbines to, to yeah, to power capitalism and give Walmart their energy and, and different mining and industrial construction companies energy in Mexico. So all of it was being exported and people rose up successfully. They actually displaced that project. They moved the project to, to the north. So it still got built, but they were able to actually at least slow down and minimize some of the damage to the lagoon, which is ultimately a struggle still in place that's harder than it's ever been in terms of narco paramilitaries and the force through a, the trans Sismico corridor, the so an industrial corridor at the narrowest point between the Pacific and the Gulf of Mexico. There's a lot to be said about this case. There's I've written a lot about it. I've done a lot of things there. So this is something to look at and check out, but we've got some other things to talk about cases to move through. The second case in the book that I worked on with my beloved friend, Andrea Brock, was, you know, I came back from Mexico freaking out at all the climate justice people in 2016 being like, this is, you know, it's bigger than fossil fuels, you know, it, like low carbon infrastructures are having a very serious impact, even ecocidal, and as many would argue there, genocidal impact, or at least continuing that process in this Miss of Tehuantepec. And so meanwhile, when I was in Amsterdam, three hour train right away, there was probably one of the most successful, at least to my mind, forest insurgencies, you can call it if you want to be a dick about it, that was actually successful since from 2012 to 2018, doing numerous attacks against the Humbach coal mine. And that's the thing. It was a popular struggle. There was lots of there was so much there's NGOs involved doing everything they could legally. There were climate camps. There was eventually Enda Galanda and a lot of nonviolent civil disobedience, but people ultimately at a certain point, it was actually in 2010, they decided and, and really began to roll out in 2012, that they decided that they want, didn't want to do this weekend warrior, crash the summit, climate change stuff, and they wanted to live in place, live in the forest, and live in permanent conflict to defend it and stop this mine from migrating to destroy and consume the forest. And, and the thing is, is that people had fought so hard, the amount of attacks and committed struggle to actually slow and stop this mine is impressive. And academia, of course, doesn't talk about any of that. It, it whitewashes the, the level and the intensity that people were actually struggling to, to stop and slow that mine. There's so much to say about all of these cases, but so far the, the mine, they've actually been able to save or at least stop and have a, I mean, and this is the thing with mining conflicts, they're generational. You know, even if you have a temporary win like they have right now in the Humbach Forest where they're saving some ancient woodlands, they're actually generational struggles which is, is a sad thing in many ways, but it's the reality of the situation. And that means when we're engaged in kind of anti-mega project or anti-mining struggles or anti-infrastructure, that this is to actually prepare for the long haul and that these companies will, even if you win a battle, the war is not necessarily over. And maybe it's two years, maybe it's three years, maybe it's 10 years, but they'll be back if there's the resources and the minerals there, which is something to consider. But again, the Hombok forest struggle is one that's really impressive and worth checking out. And then after that, you know, I was with a friend and I was trying to heal while my PhD was under review. And I had a friend from, from Peru who I was hanging out with. And he was like, and you know, of course I'm jabbering, talking about, oh, trying to trying to give myself some type of uh, you know, purpose that what I do is useful, talking about acad talking about all the different projects and and what I'm researching. And eventually he was like, hey man, I'd really I'd be honored if you came back to, to the village where my family's from, where they've been fighting a they've been fighting a mine for X amount of years at that point. And I was like, man, I'm tired, I'm burnt out. And I looked into it. And so the Tia Maria mine in the Valle de Tambo in the southwest corner of Peru, what was interesting is that the big company that kind of runs that that mine is Grupo Mexico, and they have a subsidiary working in the area called Southern Copper Peru. Grupo Mexico, they actually had their, they have at least one wind park. They they do, they have one wind park. There's another mining company that has two, Penolis, in the Isthmus of Tehuantepec region. And I was like, whoa, holy shit. All right, you've got them saying that they're greening their image and powering their operations in Oaxaca. Meanwhile, they're in Southwest Peru, battling these communities to try to access copper, which I don't know if you know, is completely important for any energy infrastructure and for the wind turbines that have the least amount of rare earth elements, you need approximately three tons of copper for one two megawatt wind turbine. So like the extractive cost of wind turbines is huge. And so with this and with Carlo 
trying to hype me up and go down there. I was like, all right, let's do this. And so we worked together and I went down there and what, I mean, in short, read the chapter and, and guess what? The mine still hasn't been built. People have fought over 15 years to stop the mine. And it's been a brutal fight. In 2011, after declaring a wildcat strike and making barricades, the police and military, I mean, the police flooded, but the police are highly militarized and they did everything they could to break the barricades. They ended up killing three people and I believe one cop died. And But people held and the company couldn't come in. Then the same thing happened in 2015. Not only did the police come in, but then the, there was a state of emergency for three months when occupied by the military. Again, three people died or four people died and then hundreds and all these instances, hundreds wounded and struggled, but the mine still didn't come in. So this, this case was really documenting you know, state terrorism, the way it was trying to force its way through to access this area that all around the Valle de Tambo is, is complete desert. In fact, there's an Air Force base that has conditions that resemble Mars, where they're trying to do Mars testing right above the valley. But this valley is lush green agricultural belt that people are trying to fight and defend with their lives. And one thing that's pretty crazy in this is that I've been using the lens of counterinsurgency to understand land conflicts for, I guess, the last 10 years. And it's in this case where I actually was able to interview someone who worked, who was ex-military, who worked in the hydrocarbon and mineral extraction security industry for upwards of 15 years at the time. And they more or less told me exactly how they're managing operations and how they're, how they're actually doing counterintelligence and how there's something called extuntos internos, internal affairs, where they have their, each mining company has their own counterintelligence department, where they're actually locating and looking at the leaders and the people mobilizing against these things. Also watching the municipal leaders who are maybe dealing with the company and breaking their deals. But they more or less talked about how, yeah, if there's a successful mobilization and people don't take the money, how they start strategically killing people. Likewise, they are actually looking at other mining companies to, who are trying to do concession grabs and maybe try to get in there. I found this interesting. Either way, really heavy case, but another example of at least a temporary win that's kind of ongoing and continuous right now. And, and obviously with the situation in Peru is uh, is up in the air constantly. And so yeah, things that, a lot of my research have been rough, hadn't been easy. And while I was in Peru, I was actually contacted by people in France who were really interested in my work because I had been very open about the problems of low carbon infrastructures. Uh, specifically wind turbines. And I'm not sure if everyone here is familiar with it, but if everyone is everyone familiar with ZADS, the zone to defend, the zone to defend, this is obviously an important concept that relates to all kind of indigenous land struggles. And in fact, the Zapatistas were a big inspiration for, for ZADS in France. But the mother ZAD in Notre Dame de Lons, rest in peace, at least the utopian aspirations of that that Zad was fighting a big mega airport. And what they did is again, it's this reaction against this kind of summit hopping, these climate camps, this weekend warrior stuff, where it's like, no, we're we're not gonna, we're not gonna kind of tokenize these struggles. We're gonna live in permanent conflict. We're gonna live in these areas, we're gonna develop anti-capitalist relationships, we're gonna connect with the land, and we're gonna, we're gonna protect it. So when the police come to try to evict us, we're gonna defend it. And so the ZAD concept, which is really just like any kind of autonomous struggle in any territory, uh, spread throughout France. And at one point in 2015, you know, the Monde documented there's 27 different ZADs. And La Massade was one of these ZADs, or at least labeled as such, even though there's an easy argument to be made that each one of these things, each one of these struggles are very particular and, and maybe the label, the ZAD label, especially it's been used to kind of tarnish different struggles in France, kind of moves beyond this. But what was significant about La Massade was it was fighting a mega energy transformer. So there's plans to build a big mega energy transformer in the area. And in the Aveyron, there's already been a problem since the mid 2000s of how it's been being spread with wind turbines, spread with solar panels. And so then they were trying to up the voltage and be able to kind of bring that in. And they wanted to build a big energy transformer and they were expropriating farmland. And so they began organizing against it. But what's interesting is not only was there the local impact of kind of taking over farmland, spreading more projects when the area was already energy self-sufficient with hydroelectric dams. And of course they want to build more energy because the cities and consumerism are constantly kind of consuming more of this stuff. But what's even more interesting is that this 
transformer was actually a node on a larger energy highway and corridor that you can actually trace and stretch to Morocco and even the Western Sahara region. And I'm not sure if people know about that, the Western Sahara region, but it's actually the last kind of classical colony held by Morocco that's being kind of subjugated. And there's also intense land grabbing to build concentrated solar, solar projects, wind, and things like this, which is a huge issue. And so, well, unfortunately, the story of La Massad is a bit sadder than the previous cases. In October 2019, two armored transport tanks, 200 riot police, and a couple excavators came and tore the place down. And now the transformers built. And I went back the next year and I began actually looking more at the companies and actually following the 400,000 volt power line down and actually mapping it and connecting it to various different conflicts. And it turns out there's so many struggles against wind turbines and high voltage power lines all through Southern France and Catalonia and Spain. And this is something that's talked about in there. And again, it's just to stress the point that how a lot of this kind of greening is actually, when you look at energy infrastructure, when you look at a power line, it's actually an energy stock market of buying, selling and trading uh, energy. And sometimes by the minute, sometimes by 15 minutes. And it's being done in the name of kind of being green. So you can get solar from Southern Spain and Morocco up in Germany and you can buy, sell, trade and you can be greener. But while it's being done in the name of the environment and low carbon and decarbon and whatnot, it's, it's really just a capitalist scheme to continue buying, selling and actually encouraging energy demand and encouraging this kind of economic growth that really has been a problem for a long time. And it's actually forfeiting other ways we can live and coexist with the land and each other and find other ways to break horrible kind of work habits. Very common with academia and far beyond. Then finally, you know, that looking at the high voltage power line struggle, I got cut off during COVID around Granada. And I was contacted by people who are up in Northwest Portugal or at North Central Portugal. And they're saying, yeah, Portugal is more or less being turned into a lithium mine kind of colony. And so I was brought up there from friends to, to, yeah, to look at kind of this ongoing kind of the way that the Portuguese government, and again, this is for the European Green Deal, this is for climate change mitigation laws and energy transition laws, how ultimately the landscape you're looking in front of you is past that town, it leaps from the center of the picture all the way to the left, you're trying to be made as a giant open pit lithium mine which more or less is going to go to Nordvolt or said differently to Swedish and Volkswagen kind of electric vehicle fleets. And what's interesting about this landscape you're looking at, it's also a UN agricultural heritage site. And it's actually going to face kind of expulsion of the people kind of resisting it there so they can more or less destroy an agricultural, UN recognized agricultural heritage site so they can usher in the green economy and electric vehicle fleets. And this is just madness in terms of how environmentalism is more or less become synonymous with mining and that mining companies are branding themselves as green and environmentally friendly and vital ecosystems. And most importantly, water is being kind of is, is being destroyed to actually do these mines, which is going to have rippling effects all the way to Porto and beyond. And so you can read more about that. And these are the cases and things that the book kind of gets into and then concludes by actually reflecting on all these struggles and kind of ways to move forward and what can, can be done. And so I tried to move over this as fast as I can, but, oh, oh, look at this cat. Ah, all right. We have three things to, three things I wanna talk about that I think kind of move their threads within the book, but maybe they're not developed and kind of pressed as hard as they should be. That's, I wanna talk about social war, climate change the framework, permanent ecological conflict. And I think these are the things that are, are maybe the most important things to maybe think about and to kind of move forward with. And some of this is a bit nerdy, some of it's a bit academic, but I think this has very real kind of consequences for how we conceive and think about struggle. So social war, yeah? If you're in the anarchist milieu or you've kind of been on the front lines of things, you've seen these stickers around, you are well acquainted with guerra social. And this was kind of a reaction to class war to say that, you know, it, it's more complicated than class war. This is, this is about a, an attack on social relationships and, and altering social fabrics. 
And so in a sense, this is it's it's a political lens, it's a political theory, and I'd argue a theory of colonization, and it's also a practice and an attack. And you can find three noticeable streams that I'm going to try to move through as fast as I can, because you can read about these things in other places and you can get a good taste of it in the book. But you've got Mikhail Foucault, you have uh, <laughs> which all their work on kind of disciplinary society and inter-European colonization. And the idea of politics as a continuation of war by other means. Uh, you also have kind of anarchism and insurrectionary anarchism, who's actually really developed and brought this forward. And then you also have actually looking at counterinsurgency and what that means and how that's relevant to actually assessing and identifying the struggles that where you are and where you're at and how you're trying to be undone or how land's trying to be taken from you and the community that you're in. Oh, Foucault, blah, 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 nerdy French guy. No. They were really important in saying that politics is a continuation of war by other means to really actually relate to kind of the state and politics as a relationship of force that's actually working to subjugate people. You know, Gordon called this the war, Foucault's war hypothesis. And he developed, I mean, Foucault's whole career was really looking at institutions, first the clinic and the hospital, uh, science in and of itself, and looking at epistemology of how knowledge is justified to kind of maintain these frameworks but also the prison. And a key thread within Foucault, you could actually say is social war, even though he only explicitly spoke about it kind of in passing in, in his lecture, Society Must Be Defended. The whole book, kind of Discipline and Punish, is really looking at how society's been disciplined and their social relationships kind of altered and affected to more or less, as this quote here talks about, regiments them to like a military camp and orders them to different kind of orders them into the conduct that the state prefers and specifically integrating them into the political economy of industrialization, proletarianizing them. I'm gonna spare reading this big quote, but more importantly for Foucault's contribution to social war, besides looking at these institutions, is, is really asking an important question. And he asks this in society must be defense, defended. And I call this the social war question. He asked this, looking at inter-European colonization. He says, how do you expect, they say, a few tens of thousands of wretched Normans lost in the lands of England to have survived and to have established and actually maintained a permanent power? This is an important question, and it's a simple question. How does a foreigner with less numbers and less familiar to the terrain able to come and invade you and subjugate you and maintain a legitimate power base? This, this is the question of social war. And this is really a question of colonization, of actually how this can happen. How can an external force become internal and actually set up in a legitimate government structure. And while Foucault gives some ideas of some basic ways of how that's done, which we don't need to go into, you get the basic point. The important idea with social wars is really recognizing the state as a structure of conquest and that how it's actually being used as a mechanism and in and of itself as a technology of social control that's obviously imbued with racism. It's obviously imbued with tons of different discriminations, divide and conquer tactics to kind of prop up the empire, civilization, empire, and the state. Let's let's get through some of this nerdy stuff. And social war is obviously highly developed by insurrectionary anarchism, but we can locate social war even back to the Bakunin versus Marx debates. Bakunin, very early on, and rightfully, you know, even Noam Chomsky says it, that one of the few social science predictions ever kind of called out was Bakunin calling out actually the rise of of Leninism and Stalinism in terms of Marxian ideas and what it would do. And it's really simple. You know, Marx was, an, in his earlier part of his career, things changed later on, as many will be quick to remind me, but there was a very strong economic determinism in these debates. And, and Bakunin rejected this. He said there's really important social and cultural factors. And there's a psychosocial power of the state in terms of actually when you start engaging with these bureaucracies, how they change you, how they absorb you. Because that's the thing. Marx and Bakunin both agreed the state was a problem and it had and it and it had to go. Marx just believed it had to wither away and that it would happen naturally in this kind of kind of utopian kind of perspective. Bakunin, like most anarchists, believed it had to be destroyed and you had to actively push it off the cliff. But so that's where you can see this kind of push to move beyond class, beyond economics, and to really look at the different social and cultural factors. And social war is really looking at the way that social fabrics are manipulated and how, men, and how you're trained to actually look from the perspective of those in power. And here's a lot of great people, Andre Leo, you know, 
Peter kind of brought this up, Freddie Perlman, Foucault, Joseph Gardinez, Insurrectionary Anarchism have been really good at talking about all this. And here are a couple quotes kind of talk about these things, but really trying to stress for kind of psychosocial aspects of actually what maintained capitalism and what maintained the state. I'm not going to read these things. They're there. I think you get the point. And I really just want to move along with this. And then third, when we talk about social war, you might you can more or less relate it specifically to counterinsurgency. Counterinsurgency is more or less the formalized status doctrine of social war. And David Kilcullen, Lieutenant Colonel David Kilcullen, defines counterinsurgency as a competition with the insurgent for the right and ability to win the hearts, minds, and acquiescence of the population. Yeah, this is just really to get the population to acquiesce to their to the ruler and to the different kind of political and economic order in place. And he defines hearts as explained as persuading people their best interests are served by your success and minds convincing them that you can protect them, and that resisting you is pointless. I mean, the main thing here, the counterinsurgency attempts total governmental intervention in the lives of a target population that operationalizes mutually reinforcing hard and soft strategies. And remember, counterinsurgency is colonial, is the doctrine emerging out of colonial warfare. And Brigadier General Kitson was key. And he was in Malaysia, Kenya, and also Northern Ireland. And as you know, Christian Williams and Peter Gevlus have talked about, you know, insurgency, and this comes from Kitson, insurgency can be talked about in three phases. The way the state was looking at it was you have preparation, nonviolence, and insurgency. And so they were looking at this in a very kind of limited teleological way, but ultimately the idea. Counterinsurgency is declaring permanent war on the population in terms of that. In the preparation period, they want to do everything they can to prevent things from going to nonviolence. And nonviolence isn't the XR hold the hands thing has become a lot more familiar the last 10 years. But it, it was really, you know, barricades, arson, sabotage, and a more kind of militant expression of nonviolence. And then, of course, insurgency was conceptualized as kind of Marxist Leninist approach. But in short, yeah, counterinsurgency is about deploying every type of strategy and tactic that the state can to actually manage and maintain and integrate a population into a state and also its economic kind of functions. And this can be done in a lot of ways. And, you know, obviously paramilitaries, violence, riot police, assassination, torture, and things like this. But the soft ones are very insidious in terms of actually how civil administrations and local governments are using development programs, public relations and media campaigns, also known as psychological operations, and how public relations agencies, NGOs, social scientists are deployed. And yeah, we got to remember how anthropologists, geographers, agronomists are instrumental in actually working with extractive companies in terms of coming up with plans and helping them also companies and governments measure the effectiveness of their interventions in terms of pacifying people, which is something that I've come across in multiple places in my work. And as you look in the right-hand corner, or at least my right-hand corner of the screen, you have a model. It's in the indirect, indirect methods of countering insurgency chapter, and it's called generational engagement. And I'm not sure if this looks familiar to you, but education, empowerment, and participation are the key pillars of this approach to affect in generations and to integrate them into voting, youth programs, town meetings. And, and what we're looking at here is almost a kind of a rudimentary model of social democracy. And this is this is really in the context of actually occupying different countries and how to actually pacify resistance and to integrate them into these things. And this in and of itself is, is really attacking people's social, cultural, and psychological relationships with themselves and each other. Uh, and yeah. And as was kind of said, nonviolence is actually regarded as anything challenging government is actually being labeled insurgency, which which is madness. You know, concerned citizens, people with legitimate concerns are more or less being treated as as terrorists, as as we see with the Stop Cop City movement, people putting out flyers or doing anything challenging things are being hit with these kind of terrorism enhancement charges, which it, and now this these absurd kind of RICO charges, which is which really should be embarrassing for the state for how they're conducting themselves and just doing anything they can to squash any type of opposition to their their playground of repression that they're trying to set up. Um, oh, yay, we're getting through. We're moving a bit longer than I want to. But so, yeah, 
the point is social war has is maybe is very useful to maybe assess the struggles and places where you're at and where you're in. And kind of related to social war and intervening in people's kind of mentalities and the way that they're thinking is the framework of climate change. I would argue that the framework of climate change is disempowering and an extremely concerning, uh, <laughs> it's an extremely concerning kind of framework. And I, I wrote about this a long time ago in the green economy is a continuation of war by other means. I also talked about it with Andrea in our edited volume enforcing ecocide. But I think there's a really big problem when climate change, global scale, okay, you know, the benefit of this is like, okay, the problem's global, it's really big. Oh my God, we have to do something, you know? So we can see this kind of uh, shock appeal of like, this is crazy, this is planetary, we gotta stop this, you know? This makes sense. However, as we've seen, we've gone from kind of radical environmentalism, Earth First, and other kind of eco-anarchist kind of struggle, to this kind of mass kind of demonstration and demand and, and demanding governments create climate emergencies and that they have these solutions, which as a lot of the book talks about and a lot of my work shows is a lot of the so-called environmental solutions are, it's pretty much more an extreme mining to produce low carbon infrastructures, smart technologies, the totalitarian schemes of smart cities, and also, yeah, you name it, every type of different kind of digital infrastructure to try to roll these things out. And and that the thing is, I, yeah, not to mention the conservation programs and, and Red Plus and things like this, which are which are, is a continuation of attack on an indigenous land rights and life ways. So we have we have people demanding the government deals with climate change. The solutions are just intensifying the problems and green extractivism. And so that's the thing is that you know the problem the problem is is local, like climate change is made up of 100,000 local pollutions, degradations and attacks. And we have to locate these things. We have to reclaim our agency and know that we have to struggle where we are. We have to act locally and think globally again. And that's the thing, the big problem with climate change as a framework is it's really just saying states, corporations, international collisions, but coalitions and NGOs are the ones that have the power and are going to be the agents of change. And I mean, that's the thing. Climate change as a framework has now opened up geoengineering as a, as a pathway to this. And again, a crazy new market of humans. It's the basis of so many sci-fi films, thinking of Snowpiercer, of actually how humans are going to try to geoengineer and control the environment and what it's going to do. And it's it just, it again, it kind of reinforces this kind of, I would call climate masculinities. Where and it's following some of the my favorite kind of energy, my feminist energy researchers, and it's emphasizing these grand scales, reductionary data rooted in approaches of scientific domination of the planet, which marginalizes or ignores other scientific approaches in terms of living with these things. And so, it's it's again it's the same problem with eco Leninism. Climate change is is this like oh it's so big we can control this we can use our graphs we can use all these universities but let let's be honest and let's look at myself here the amount of resources that are, are being slayed to measure the destruction of the planet you know the amount of clicks the amount of paper the weird corporate profits from academics you know there's nothing sustainable there's nothing even reasonable about universities and they should be the ones on the forefront of setting examples by growing by by putting food in the campuses, growing food vertically, but kind of becoming energy self-sufficient and setting these things. But far from it. It's just absorbing resources and it's coming up with these harebrained schemes that are just intensifying the existing kind of capitalist schemes that I don't see helping the planet. And so that that leads to the next thing, you know, the science behind it. Carbon is the main measure and framework. And again, Peter Gelderloos is great talking about climate reductionism, how there's so many issues and things that are leading to ecological problems that are leading to climate change, but we're just talking about carbon. And there's been the these kind of the cats up in up in Sweden, they have something called carbon tunnel vision, it's been a great graphic that was made uh, by Jan. But Carbon is a measure of framework. We can't be reducing the world into carbon. There's so many different ways. And if we, if you want to look at a mining site or infrastructure projects for how tailing dams break or different floods happen, it's insane. Where did it come from? Why are we talking about carbon? Why is climate change the main framework and why are we talking about carbon? Oh, 
Go figure, in 2001, the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, a corporate accounting and reporting standard, was designed by the World Resource Institute and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. It's like, oh, wow, private sector think tanks trying to advance kind of green capitalism are the ones scheming these things up. Go figure. And again, there, it's being called science, but it might more accurately be called arithmetic or accounting or some type of economics, which I meant, which is, yeah, that's a whole other whole another story. But this leads to the, the next question is like, how is this, you know, how is carbon even collected? And again, carbon's being used to actually commensurate methane and different gases. And, you know, how and why are people doing this? And there's so endless amounts of modeling and things going on that are doing this. But it still raises the question is, how is, the, how is carbon being collected? How is data being collected? There's approximately three ways this is being done. There's direct measurement, which makes the most sense. You're putting sensors at the kind of the tailpipes of at the smokestacks of factories and different measurement sites in different places. And that's going to give you something. However, it doesn't really take into account at all the way industrial systems work in terms of how things are breaking, things are leaking in different places, not to mention where's the incentive to actually to report these things, which is something we'll talk about a little bit more. Then there's energy-based calculations, you know, calculating the amount of energy that's going into a certain operation or factory, which again, makes sense, but it's very abstract. It's not maybe, there's a lot of moving, so many moving parts in different factories or in different facilities and how these works. Again, the mode of production and industrial supply chains are super complex. And then there's the out, and then there's looking at economic input output life cycle assessments, which again, are far removed and then raises questions about the data that's being collected often from these private sector kind of, uh, there's many different private sector databases that you've got to pay to that are very limited. And, and there's, there's so many, many of these things are complex. There's so much missing data, a lot of assumptions. And more importantly, as a 2017 sustainable, sustainability supply chain textbook talks about, which says there's no such thing as sustainable supply chains, is that 14% of supply chains are only 14% of supply chains are accounted for from companies, only 14% because they're bounding their models at the borders of countries. And through subcontracting schemes, they're not actually responsible for the extractivism and different things they're doing. And yeah, so this leads to actually talking about low carbon infrastructures, wind, solar, and it's insane how much mining and material that they need. Look at the offshore wind. Look. But yeah, like I was saying, it requires so much metal, so much material, that things aren't even accounted for. Even in the graph that you're looking at right now, the steel and aluminum are not included. And this, this is the main kind of infrastructural parts of, of wind turbines, for example, or the frames of solar panels. And the amount of extraction is insane. As everyone can see, even by the accounting that I question, it's not getting any better. We're running out of colors. We're running out of shades of black if we look at these things. And you can see here in terms of the amount of materials that are being used, low carbon infrastructures are very low on it. And one of the main points that I've been making for years, really that behind every type of low carbon infrastructure are, is diesel fuel, is fossil fuels. Behind the smelting is, is coal and things like that. There's fossil fuels everywhere. And really, there's renewability nowhere. There's nothing really renewable but these things. And so that's why I use the term low carbon infrastructure. And I, or even for the climate justice people, fossil fuel plus could be another way to talk about low carbon infrastructures or wind turbines, that they're fossil fuels. And then there's an added plus of kinetic energy extraction. So yeah. And the last part, which I hopefully people here, is just to really, is to really give a, a shout out to permanent conflict. And this kind of idea of permanent conflictuality, self-organization, informal organization, attack, really rooting your kind of self-motivation and joy, not to guilt yourself, not finding power in guilting others and guilting yourself. You know, I think it's about actually empowering each other and using easily reproducible means to actually engage in struggle and to stay safe. And the book really is an advocate of permanent ecological conflict, which is, is really just adding the ecological on there. And this is a reaction to, yeah, this is a reaction to a lot of things. And this is really asking people if they self-identify with the system, 
what's their relationships to beings and existences. You know, it's a necrocene, it's killing things, it's not an anthropocene, you know. And a, a big thing about social war and all these things is to really ask, you know, how are people identifying with the state and what's around them? And do they self-identify with the television and technologies? And if they do, then, then they're maybe going to see these democratic processes as representative of them and that these wonders of technology that are being forced on them that they've never had a choice in as being great and magical things. And, and really, it's, it's about really kind of fight where you stand and to create space, you know, to have this dogmatic approach of just aiming towards an anti-authoritarian ecological struggle and that wherever you are, whatever your skills, whatever weird position and institutions to do wherever you can to make those spaces so people can breathe and actually, and to work with these things. And a big thing is if say, even if you're a politician or you're somewhere up there and you, and you really care about the environment because so many of them are saying that they do, then immediately stop and destroy terrorism enhancement charges. Get rid of this, stop criminalizing protests and struggle in defense of land, sea, and ultimately people's dignity. Um, and really the importance of actually looking into informality and kind of looking at different ways of organizing and actually really trying to think outside of kind of traditional, I'd say even colonial forms of organization are so important. And yeah, to remember that the main point in all this behind the egos, behind the infighting and all these things is to stop extractivism, improve all relationships and harmony, soil, water, trees, plants, food, quality, and, and ultimately meaning in life. And it's really about creating real and authentic renewability. So with that, I go on too long. There's a lot to say. There's so much more in the book. And I'll, I'll leave you with my troublemaking cat friends here who have all sorts of uh, troublesome beliefs. So yeah, thanks everyone. And sorry for this presentation of being longer than I want it to be every time. Great. Thanks, man. Uh, I, I think I'll just jump in. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much, Sander, for, for the invitation to, to, to give a few comments on this book. Um, and also Liberty and Firestorm for organizing this. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. So, well, to those who, well, I, I guess Liberty introduced me at, at the beginning, but uh, really quickly, I'm Carlos Tornel. And, um, well, I'm a friend of Sanders. Uh, we've been working together for a while now, uh, doing a, a couple of uh, academic stuff, research uh, around energy, energy justice, energy transitions, precisely a little bit of what Sander was talking throughout his presentations uh, in this one. But, um, in particular, I mean, when, when Sander forwarded me the book, when I read it, um, my first impression was that this is many books in one. And what I mean by that is I think that the book can be read as a journey. I mean, you can read it. It's, <laughs> I found it very like fantastical how Sander is moved from one place to the other. Like it's like a serendipitous thing. So it reminded me like a very, like a, a moment of call Sander from one place to the other and he's moving along these different places where he gets to, you know, see and actually transmit in a very provocative way, but also in a very clear way, what is the cost of renewability, you know? And I, and I know, I mean, at the beginning of, our, of this conversation, we were talking with Liberty saying something about, well, we have now solar in some buildings and everything is a little bit changing into these new technologies. But I think what the book really does transmit is to let you see, let you experience, of course, not firsthand, but like very close, similar to if you were there, what is the cost of that renewability? What is the cost of this supposed solutionism that is created around climate change? What does this discourse of greenness entail? You know, it sort of answers like some of the most basic questions, I would say, like why is, you know, renewable energy no, not enough? Why is, you know, so a, a electing a politician that would talk about the Green New Deal or will let you see that the solution is a technological innovation or to cut tax, you know, taxes for businesses or whatever, stuff like that, you know? Sort of like answers those questions, but goes deeper. It lets you see that particular way of seeing the world. That ontology, that Sander uses this word in the text, this way of seeing the world, looking at reality through the lens of extraction, as if everything can be commodified, extracted, used in the purpose of feeding this system. What the system, I think, is, of course, you know, capitalist modernity, let's say, 
but it lets you see how the system thinks, how it operates, and what it does to you, what is the cost to li of living as humans, as non-humans in that system. So I think in that term, in that sense, the journey is, is wonderful. It's, of course, also devastating. It's hard. It's hard to read, I'll tell you. At times I was reading and I had to stop because it was, oh man, this is terrible, you know? But that that sensation that what it transmits, I think, is 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 important, and it's a thing. It's a thing I think we need to have in uh, to understand very clearly in which modernity we are in, in what system, in what system we are inhabiting, and what is the cost of that system. And it's also, I think, a, a, I sort of read it like a, like an instruction manual. And <laughs> I know that sounds very technical, but when I was reading, I also see. I think Sander was touching at the end this this phrase that he coins here is what he uses, permanent ecological conflict. I think one of the most pernicious things that modernity has done is try to convince us that we are exempt from this ecological conflict, that it doesn't apply to us if we live in cities, if we live in the north, if we live far away, you know, in Mexico, for example, where I'm, where I'm from, where I'm at, the, the, the problems are not here in Mexico City, they're out there, you know, in Oaxaca, in the front lines, where the communities are resisting, in, in the mines where people are saying no, you know, of course in the US is the same, you know, the mines, the, you know, African American communities, all of these places that have been rendered a just place for extraction, for exploitation, for degradation. And the, the front lines is where you, you, you see the conflict. So that we can separate it very nicely. We see, so we see it on TV, it's not, it's not something that we measure in our everyday lives. And I think what Sander is saying, echoing, I think in my perspective, we can of course, uh, talk about this a little bit more, but what the Zapatistas also say when in 2015, when they were talking about the capitalist Hydra, they were saying, well, uh, we are not in a third world war, uh, we are actually in a fourth world war. The, the fourth world war means basically that we live in permanent ecological struggle, social struggle in our everyday lives, because the state, the violence, the purpose is now creeping in into every single aspect of our reality. And I think Sander captures us very, very nicely with this concept of social war, how it's extended into our everyday lives, you know, and how pernicious this concept is or used by the, by the governing institutions to make us believe that, uh, you know, to convince us to, 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 to continue living in this, in this modern world, despite its ecological costs, you know? So um, when I read this, as, as I read this book in these two particular ways as a manual, but also as like this wonderful journey um, of course, very devastating, but wonderful. Uh, I, I, I thought to myself, we have to, we have to bring this to more people. We have to translate it. So that's what we're doing. We're translating the book, sort of like trying to, to, to gain access, but also because in the South, when we think about people in the North struggling, let's say, let's put it like that. <laughs> uh, we, we usually, again, think in terms of like uh, Extinction Rebellion, the Sunrise Movement, all of these people who are I, I'm not trying to say that it doesn't work, but I'm trying to say that I, we see it as not enough. You know, we see it like, okay, it's good. It's good that these people are saying this, that there's, they're raising their voices, that they're saying stop. But I think this other part, that it's also there. Because we read academia, we read this mainstream uh, news, this stuff, uh, it's not accessible to us to actually see how people are resisting this in the other places. It's not just the global South. Of course, we can, of course, say that there's always been a South in the North. You know, but sometimes it gets blurred. We, we, we blur it with these stupid distinctions. And I think it, it's difficult for us to see what's happening. So uh, this is what I think uh, sort of compelled me to sort of like say, yes, this is an important book. This is something that must be read. This is a way of understanding our, our problematic relationship with modernity, how it convinces us to stay, to stick with it, and then to move uh, forward, to create those coalitions, those movements of solidarity that we should be already weaving together between North and South or uh, you know, geographical North and geographical South. I think that this is something that um, moved, me to, moved me to do it. So yeah, just um, don't want to take more time on that, just to, to, to sort of say why it's relevant, why I think this book is wonderful. And um, I'll try to, I'll try to uh, maybe ask a couple of questions to Sandra before we move to, to, to the, to the Q&A from the, from the rest of the audience. But uh, what, I, what I'll start saying is I think there's a, the, the epigraph of the book where the book begins with a small phrase. It says, uh, the, the, it's a, I think it's an Irish saying or a very old saying, so it's saying like the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, you know? And I think this encompasses very well 
why the enemy is not just fossil fuel companies, it's not just corporations. It's also, you know, the, the, our supposed fake friends and the false solutions that are being presented out there. And I think um, for me, it resonated very beautifully with a phrase that Ivan Illich sort of put out as well. Um, in, in 1969, he said, it's not only that the road to hell is paved with good intentions, but we have to say to hell with good intentions. We have to condemn them and you have to say, we don't want, we don't need that anymore. So I think uh, when you when you start in the book with this with this sentiment, um, I think that you, what you're transmitting is precisely this, that we, we have to cease uh, being afraid of trying to always be the middle, uh, stand in the middle, always trying to have create a dialogue, always trying to say, hey, maybe this is not that bad. Maybe it's better to have, you know, Biden to Trump, of course, <laughs> in a way it's better. But, you know, they, I think we, we should be we should not be afraid to say to hell with this. And what we need is to actually understand our reality as a permanent ecological struggle. So maybe I'll start with that. Uh, ask you like, uh, how is the how is it compelled you to to, to ser sort of say like this is not enough. We must do more, and then we can jump to another one. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> and there's so many people. I mean, I mean, Carlos, you spent a lot of time in a university. Also, there's a lot of people. I mean, and I, I mean, it's a, there's so many people that want to do good. They want to help brown people, you know. Oh, and, and even in the decolonial camp, you know, there's this implicit kind of thing like, like being an academic or making it into the academy is like somehow the best. And you're always looking out a window and you're always like, oh, how can you help these other poor people out there? Never. I mean, and maybe some of these people have full tenure track positions. My experience has been very rough and not very nice in terms of how one's treated and is exploited with teaching and things like this. But there's always this, these good intentions of looking out a window and, and never really looking at the infrastructure of the place. I mean, there's no shortage of people complaining about work and how messed up it is, how sexist it is, how homophobic it is, and all these, and how exploitative it is. But at the same time, there's this failure to really actually look at how toxic these positions are and then really look outside and actually tokenize other people based on certain characteristics, often just being in the global South. And it's been a really big problem for me that there's, man, there's hardcore squatting, anti-police struggles, ecological struggles right outside the university that no one's talking about. And it's, and it's, and there's people going to jail and there's, there's, there's shit hitting the fan outside in Europe and different places. But so in these institutions that, Oh my God, there's so many good intentions that are just doing shit. And some of the good intentions I'm, I'm tied up in, you know, even publishing in these weird corporate, in these journals that are run by these big corporate publishing houses that are making, making profits on par with mining companies, you know? So yeah, it's, it's this, you have these, I mean, it, it was also, you know, Klee said it very well with accomplices, not allies and just, all this, all these people trying to help, but don't want to actually struggle. Don't even aren't locating their own struggle and what they're doing, and and where they're at. And it's always it's always someone else. It's always over there. It's always this poor person. And and the weird toxic middle class life that they have is somehow is somehow like the way to be. And I guess that's the American dream, right? And that's reinforcing it. And the developmental dream as it was exported in post nineteen forty nine. So yeah, I talked too much. Today. I'll I'll leave it there. That's great, man. Thank you. No, I think yeah, I think that's that's one of the points I also see in the book. For example, when you make the critique about the growth, for example, I think it's also like uh, you also mentioned this in the presentation. But how it has become, you know, uh, you know, even if it's a critical position, it stays within academia. It sort of reflects or sustains some of the the problems that are are embedded into the academia. You know, so I think yeah, what I think is important of, for, for the book is just not to see this as, you know, academic trends sort of saying like, oh, you know, it's good that you can reduce our emissions or whatever. It's sort of like becoming like this very romanticized, let's say, middle class dream, when in reality it should be like a, a proper way of like not only questioning our relationship uh, with uh, ourselves, with nature, uh, with the state, but also of, re of reformulating how we act and how we position ourselves in those eco permanent ecological struggles, you know? So yeah, I, I found that also very valuable. And uh, I think it's a very important critique to make as well, because sometimes if, if we don't say that, if we don't do anything, we just can easily be stick with our positions within academia and sort of sustain that problem, you know? 
And uh, yeah, speaking about sustaining the problem, I also want to ask you, I think you touched uh, a little bit in the presentation, but there's also, I think you, you sort of framed it very nicely with three words, you know, you, you call it the science of maintaining a ecological catastrophe, right? And I think it's very nicely put how you use these three words, which are um, energy, biodiversity, and carbon, to sort of like make a, how does modernity reduces. It's not only this tunnel vision, but also how it utilizes these these words to sort of frame them in a way that we we can can convince us to 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 maintain ourselves within modernity. You know, so maybe if you can talk a little bit about more about that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the thing I always thought for the weird U.S. cartoon kind of pop culture reference, I always think that Rick and Morty episode where if you're familiar with the show, which many may not be, there's the episode where Morty and his dad, Jerry, are doing a science project. Yeah. And they're making that a solar system. And Jerry just really excited to be the best dad he is. He's like, yeah, and there's Pluto. And his son's like, man, Pluto's not a planet. And for some reason, he just digs his heels in and just wants to believe that there's there's Pluto and just keep saying Pluto's a planet, Pluto's a planet, and it's it's a celestial star. Long story short, he gets abducted to go to Pluto where they just say that he's a renowned scientist from planet Earth and they just the elite class there just puts him on stages to say Pluto is a planet and everyone claps and has champagne. And mm -hmm. I just feel that with a lot of what's going on, especially with within economics and, and the modeling, like ultimately this climate change modeling, and obviously there's great climate change modelers and people, and I'm thinking of Kevin Anderson and people who are really pressing on things. But I feel like the amount of modeling studies I'm reading related to solar, wind, and all this stuff, and you, besides it being so difficult to unpack, and I spent now years reading and emailing and trying to understand, is that I just really feel that the science, these things going on are just really there. It's like half the shit's just made up. It's so abstract these data points being plugged into models, and it's just there to kind of continue this process. It's just there to, to reinforce capitalism, advance green capitalism, and, and maintain the existing. And, and so, I mean, it's no secret. I think Jason Moore even kind of derived the, the, role, the role science has just has been and just kind of reinforcing the state and kind of capitalism. And it's just, the, the more I've been in this, the more I've sat on these panels and seen the way that things work, it's just, it just feels so, it's insane how rigged and almost like made up the whole thing is. And when I say made up, it's just really, it's just the series of abstractions just build on each other. And the fact is people are acclimated to a particular lifestyle, way of being and conduct, which for some reason I was, I was maladjusted in terms of how I was brought into society and academic institutions. And I, I just see people being very comfortable speaking about abstractions and, and really not questioning these things. And if and if you're on the ground, if you're with communities and if you're looking at these minds, you're just like, man, <laughs> your models aren't adding up. Like this doesn't make sense. And if you try to ask like what the data is and where it comes from and you follow those down the stream, it's it's uh it's maddening. So it's so yeah. And then so the categories carbon, energy and biodiversity are these very convenient categories that are just these implicit things that we might believe in that are these kind of tools or these constructs that are that are kind of pushing this thing through. But yeah, thanks for the questions. Carlos. Thanks for the kind words for the book. Of course, man. Yeah, um, I'll do one more before we pass to the <laughs> to the to the to the audience. Um, <clears throat> well, it's actually two, but maybe we can make a, merge them into one. I wanted to push you a little bit more to say about what does real renewability entail. Mm. I think the book does a wonderful job of 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 taking us to these places where the cost of renewability, so-called renewability, of course, is uh, is experienced firsthand. You know, the people living in the front lines against the mine, against the copper mines, against, you know, the wind wind farms, all of these, uh, you know, industries that are creating, but very perniciously using the concept of decarbonization of climate change uh, to legitimize this new form of extraction, let's say. But um, what I wanted to ask is that uh, I've, I've when I read this thing about the field manual that you that you presented the that you expressed in the presentation also at the end, this little graph where they say like how you convince people, how you win hearts and minds, uh, you also have said this in the book, but also elsewhere that the state is colonialism. You know, it's a continuation of that colonial legacy 
that continues to produce a particular way of being like citizens like so i i was maybe like if if we if we had to take away something from this like how or what do you think our relationship with the state should be i know you you, you say this of course in the in the book but maybe if, if i can press you a little bit more on that uh, I think the, 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 the struggle in the, in the German forest and how much for it sort of like reveals very clearly what does <laughs> it entail to actually resist. But if the people that say, well, I'm not there, I'm here in the city, that's too far away, you know, how do we bring that ecological struggle into our everyday lives? And how do we, you know, sustain uh, that resistance or uh, contest that relationship to the state? You know, how, how do we do not fall prey? Of that uh, enticing dream that modernity sells, you know, and I just I mean I, I want you to press you a little bit on that one. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so the first part, real renewability, is, I think, is is the challenge. You know, I'm I'm a believer in, you know, from the situation's perspective, to demand the impossible. You know, and I and I think especially if I'm gonna uh, kind of be an intellectual masturbator and be playing in the academic sector, then I I think that there should be an uncompromising ideal and kind of setting out the the areas and the trajectories that we should be trying to be aiming for. And it's technically the things that kind of capitalists or industrial society are kind of preaching in terms of sustainability and renewability and things like this. But it's to say like, yeah, but we need to actually have real renewability. We need to actually work to actually have those relationships. We need to try to create these things. This, this is the task ahead of us, is how do we actually do this? And hopefully it can be a pleasurable and enriching process. And then moving more, and then kind of the second part of that is so, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm sure everyone's noticed things aren't looking so good in a lot of ways, you know, ultimately there's a full-blown and blatant genocide going on in Gaza right now. And, you know, wh where's our power to stop this, you know, and it's maybe a bit of the same thing as climate change, you know, in terms of actually having to rely on bigger powers and military to actually intervene and to stop these things and make consequences for these things. So. With that said, is more than ever, you know, the state is a problem. It is colonialism. It's it's a virus, as so many have said before. And but at the same time, we're embedded in it. We're in it. It's done everything it can to kind of infuse itself with our lives, make us dependent politically, socially, and things like this. So obviously, to try to separate and to kind of create those kind of lines of autonomy, but at the same time, use what you can from it. You know, which is it's not something I like saying, but and one of the things that I think is important, and I guess maybe this is the most book chain esque kind of aspect, is that I've seen I've seen the usefulness in these struggles of actually when there are mayors and there are municipalities that are like genuinely worried about what's going on and what's being kind of hit in there. Um that those are actually spaces that can be used, you know, that there are spaces on the local. They can be used and be an important sites to actually host talks, conversations, and to collaborate and be an interface for people who are maybe from the outside to actually work and learn and to actually understand the locals in an area who are fighting a mine or things like this. And I guess the kind of the more controversial kind of aspect, especially more in a in an anarchist space, is that you know it's it's really is to maybe kind of break that dogmatism and just obviously people got to do what they got to do and their obligations for themselves, you know. But it is actually how can you develop the infrastructure and in ways to actually protect yourself from repression? How can you actually kind of mobilize things the best and and try not to sacrifice different principles or the means by which you do them, but at the same time to to really, yeah, to kind of line it up, to do what you can to to engage what kind of resources are there because the state is, is it's not just a, mono, a monolithic thing. There's lots of cracks, dissident institutions, internal and institutional conflicts. And it is to use those aspects the best you can, but mind you not to be foolish and thinking of Bakunin, and there's a quote in there that I didn't read, just the way that the institutional process will change you, will discipline you and will absorb you and to have a constant tension against that and to not be celebratory of it and not have the, the, end, the means become the ends but to use these things the best you can to create spaces of liberation and to struggle. And finally, you know, yeah, people need to connect with their environments where they are in urban environments, there's trees. I mean, I, I think the important thing and maybe the eco-anarchist insight is that the fate of trees and humans, you know, in a capitalist and status system where 
we're all viewed as resources, whether it's a labor or timber commodity. And we're often kind of contained and surrounded by concrete walls. You, I mean, people are put in cells in their apartments and have to pay rent for it. You look out the window, the tree's also in case, <laughs> enclosed by concrete and brick and it's trying to bust out and break through the curb. And so it, it is really kind of connecting into, into, yeah, to squat, to struggle, to make that, to start. You could, I mean, there's so many things to do, you know, and it means talking with your neighbors, seeing where they're at. And I think the biggest challenge is, is drug addiction, different kind of health ailments, lack of access to to really health and support and even in quality foods. And, and this makes organizing difficult and, and working with people in many instances and just really beginning a process of organizing, talking to neighbors about how to, to, to be less dependent, to secure your food, to actually begin a process of deep paving roads and growing food. And, and again, trying to make it a pleasurable process and not to mention there's maybe a more antagonistic side. I'm giving maybe a prefigurative example of what people can do to kind of begin living in ways and, and developing networks. But then there's also there's also more antagonistic approaches in terms of people uh, doing what they feel they got to do against the things that they feel that are trying to destroy them. So yeah, hopefully that's that's a mouthful. <laughs> Thanks, Sander. No, but I think it's it's important. I think it was it's it's useful. Uh, for me also to, to to hear and I think a lot of people will also appreciate like uh, since we are in this very complicated civilizatory crisis that is so extended such to such an extent that um, capitalism still won't die it's just like a zombie that keeps growing and devouring stuff at, on its path you know so how do we contest I think how do we resist I think it's a it's a an important point and I think it's something that we should also take into account. I also like that what you said about like coming in from from below. You know, it's not like these global things that are. Uh, in, you know, we had 28 climate conferences. Uh, emissions keep growing. Their solutions are not coming from there. So we know we have the evidence to say that okay, that doesn't work. But now we have to put, focus our attention to where does it work. You know, and uh, yeah, coincidentally, you know, this is the 30th anniversary of the Zapatistas here also uh, of the EZLN in Mexico. So uh, yeah, so I think it's a moment where we should we should also learn to listen to those other, like they say, to those other belows or those many belows that are emerging. Uh, sort of like uh, you know, and also I think you also mentioned this in the book. Uh, Peter Gelder says it: the solutions are already here, right? So we don't need to to invent or create something. We just need to listen. We need to learn to to listen to each other and to rethink our relationships with each other and nature, and uh, you know, no humans. So um, yeah, without further ado, I, I can go to the to the questions. We have a couple of questions from the audience. Hold uh, on, let me, let me reply to that. Let me reply to that yeah, really yeah, quickly. Ahead. I mean, but I mean, what we're in is a long battle. You know, this is something that's been going on for centuries. You know, if you if you're siding with the plants, the rivers, <laughs> and and really trying to live in, in some type of harmony with the planet, and not be a kind of a destructive force, like this is a this is a 500 if not 5,000 year kind of struggle that's been going on. So this is not a new struggle and and kind of to the point that you're making, I just want to stress, you know, just this idea, it, it's a processual, it's a processual concern that I'm saying, you know, where, yeah, right now we have to do geoengineering, control the state, do all this stuff like this, you know, it's like, hey, like besides the crazy manufacturing and pollution and things that you're trying to crank out with all your eco-modernist kind of schemes that are really the reality of like a 1970s dystopian film a lot the, the environmental situation is not looking good even if you're yeah. even if you manage to kind of slow it down and this this really is the question about how does one live their life how does one do this how does one live and this is about living in a way that is consistent and joyful and that is in in conflict it's, it's living in permanent ecological conflict and when talking about conflict that that doesn't mean burn yourself out and hurt yourself, which I think is the normal, is the normal kind of reaction. And I think many of us have gone through over the years, but this is like actually how to live, how to struggle and how to continue doing this, which really means looking into mental health strategies, making sure that you are actually training and doing kind of healthy physical stuff, whether this is Kung Fu or, or whatever type of things, but really coming up with health strategies to actually be able to sustain, to live well, and not put your hopes into some harebrained politician that wants to melt the world through some type of eco-modernist scheme. But yeah, with that, yeah, I just want to stress that it's it's about 
it's about living our lives the best we can and, and, and being true to our own obligations to kind of what we're dealing with in our lives and what we see happening to people and, and, and creatures and existences that we love, you know? Indeed, man. No, thank you very much. I think, uh, yeah, that's closing. I think on a, on a lot more uh, hopeful note. So uh, <laughs> I'll go on with that. I mean, the struggle keeps going. But, uh, you know, again, I'm sorry, I keep repeating Zapatistas and stuff. But uh, it's a, they use a circular, you know, a lot of people get depressed with that. It's like, oh, no, it never ends. Yeah, but it never ends. But the, the point is, like, how do we find joy in the struggle? How do we, uh, you know, uh, see other ways of relating to ourselves through that process, you know? So I think that's the beauty of it. Or that, I think that's, I guess, the trick, you would say, of how you look at that struggle, you know? So, yeah, just, I mean, just a little bit cautious of the time, but uh, I think the two questions we have are also really good. So um, I'll pass it on to you. So the first one, it says, um, how do we, how do you recommend new researchers interested in this field to start? What lessons have you found that can help make this research more successful? And what do you need to uh, be better supported? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I can get, I, I think first, I think it's important, the best thing everyone can do, researcher or not, is to, is to find out, to check in with yourself and who you really are and what your, what your struggle is and what your fight is. You know, I, I think it's, and maybe going back to something I was already saying, it's been funny over the years, just watching people and how they perceive themselves as privileged, yet they might not even see the asylum that they have themselves kind of caged in and, and operating in and feeding into. And I think it's really important to actually locate your struggle and where you're at and where you stand on these things and to know who you are and, and what you're fighting and, and what you want to create. And it's this kind of self-knowledge and knowing yourself is, is fundamentally important, not only to how you'll position yourself in life and, to, and who you are, but then, of course, if you're going to be doing research, what you're going to do. And once you know who you are and what you want to make and create and what what matters to you and what type of a, wh who your friends are and what people you want to be hanging out with and what type of struggles you want to be fighting in or being and is all right you want to be a researcher you want to play university or whatnot or maybe not i think it's so important to i i believe there's a very strong there's an ethic kind of an ethic in research where it's like okay you know ultimately researching is can, can be open source intelligence like there's no need to be researching struggles you know whatever weird infighting and stuff going on like that's for that stuff to be resolved they don't need a weird social scientist listening and writing this stuff and this has been a big problem in terms of you know researchers in squatting who actually were just recording conversations of squatters and people like that I'm thinking of in the amsterdam scene and, and the books that came out of there and it goes everywhere in the way that oh my God, there's drama and, and gossip in indigenous communities and how a lot of anthropology is just shocked by this and fixating on those and things like that. And so it's it's actually about researching the things that the powers that be, to find it as you will, what they're trying to hide, you know, what type of financial flows, what type of repressive technologies, what kind of divide and conquer techniques, what you name it, you know, where, yeah, what is the stuff? That governmental powers and profiteers and and ultimately people enacting structural or physical violence in the community generate information and, and ultimately academics products about that you know you should be targeting the people that are trying to do those things and researching those things don't research the movements because you think social movements are really cool and you want to go hang out with them you know there's other ways you can hang out with them you don't have to research them and and again, this is a really big problem as someone who supervises students is that ultimately there's a lot of people and if you can make it into a university, they've kind of been institutionalized their whole life and they come to be researchers to actually try to go live their life, but they're living their lives by looking at the world through a window and, and living through other people's lives and not living their own and finding their own struggles. And I think this is, is, is a fundamentally serious problem. Yeah, thank you. No, I agree. I think. I think uh, again, it sort of like brings us back to the to the question about, you know, activism versus what, you know, militant struggle. How do we, you know, commit ourselves to doing this and not just do it like a, you know, academic tourism or whatever, you know, and just research because it's interesting. I think that's something that we need to sort of bring that 
uh, Yemen. And but that's the thing, and it, and it, and you know this very well because we've had these conversations before. Is just even that distinction between a researcher and an activist. That in of itself is the sleight of hand. It's it's already that move that is trying to single out activity that cares and is trying to struggle. You know, we have to destroy that dichotomy. And and really, at least with anthropology and human geography, is that you know you have a positionality. How, do, the, doing the stronger, better research, the more honest, better, stronger research, and kind of declaring your subjectivities and whatever. Doing kind of quote scholar activism isn't helping you. It's best just do the shit, cross those T's and dot those I's in terms of the research you're doing. Because the more truthful and the more kind of accurate things are, the better it is in terms of actually understanding a situation that you're in or a struggle. And when we start, and then a lot of people are self branding themselves scholar activists, and it's maybe a cool publishing niche or a certain kind, there's benefits with identity. But at the same time, you're outing yourself and you're actually falling into this objectivity subjectivity trap that doesn't doesn't really exist, but people still think that there's some type of objectivity and this kind of positivism going on. I mean, and it doesn't. You have completely biased and ideologically driven, quote, objective research that's more serious. And and that's the thing. Like we have to live, we have to come, we we can't, we can't commodify our activities as activists. It's it's people have to to live. People have to be. And that being, if you're if you're looking at what's going on around you, it means you're going to have to start defending yourself and moving in certain ways. True, man. No, I think that's that's wonderful advice, and I think uh, it's an advice I would like to have listened to when I was, uh, <laughs> you know, starting doing research. And and I think, uh, yeah, because it's not something you encounter when you meet in university, you know. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's wonderful, wonderful advice. Uh, there's another one here. Uh, it says, how can we distinguish between projects that will legitimately help us to transition off of fossil fuels and those that are perpetuating capitalist consumer consumerist imperatives? I think the short answer is, I think you should read this book. <laughs> but uh, what can you say, Matt, for, to that? I mean, at a path a certain scale, it's most, I mean, that's the thing. I, I think there's ways that community scale projects, which means you are engaging in an industrial scale, low carbon infrastructure project. These can be organized and done well, even though there is a, a, sl a slate of literature. And I think Christina Ciamanta's kind of paper that community renewable energy ecologies, I believe it is, in Journal of Political Ecology is a great paper actually showing that a lot of the kind of the community projects are actually have a lot of pitfalls that you have to watch out for but i mean no matter what there's going to be an extractive footprint and i think it is it is to kind of yeah use these become energy my, my line is become cultivate energy autonomy take back your power literally and metaphysically you know reduce the kind of area of consumption and, and production and kind of eliminate the power lines and those infrastructures and and really know what you're consuming and what you need and I think that in of itself is, is first and foremost important, but this also means actually trying to remedy and to create a reciprocal cycle to remedy those kind of extracted, the mining, the chemical processing and different things like this to kind of remedy those kind of supply chains. Because that's the thing, there's no such thing as, as renewable or fossil fuels. This dichotomy is some weird shit that came out of the 1970s from the US Department of Energy. And a lot of it was a way to actually kind of mitigate the kind of the oil crisis that was going on in 1973. And so it's it's really, yeah, it, it's about degrowing kind of material and energy throughput, which doesn't mean it has to be some shitty austerity or you have to fall to shit. Obviously, if your main priority is video games and some high technology, it could mean that. And there's going to be a, a different kind of a more challenging dance that you have to do. But again, I think it's about using those technologies on a certain scale to kind of affirm a type of energy autonomy and then and then working to remediate those supply chains and those damages the best you can. And I don't mean some type of offsetting, but it might even look like hopefully a more, hopefully it could look like a more intentional, a more, I don't know how to even say it here, but just really doing what you can to just stop the spread of forever chemicals and weird industrial disasters and, and the mining and, and do what you can to work in solidarity with the communities who are fighting either for labor rights or trying to shut those mines down who are, who are polluting those areas. And I guess Miles Lennon talks about it's, you know, supply chain solidarity and actually how to actually enact that. And again, 
these are challenges that are open and, and in need of experimentation. And I think there's some stuff going on, but it's, uh, it's, um, yeah, there's more to be kind of done and developed. I know that we've got another question in our queue, but since we have run a little over, and that was actually a really great one to end on, I think, just in terms of um, uh, really kind of continuing with the kind of positive vision of, of what the alternative is, I'm going to suggest we go ahead and wrap here. Uh, it's been like a huge pleasure to hear y'all um, sharing ideas and talking through some of this really important um, content. Xander and Carlos, thanks so much. If you've got any final thought you want to get out there, I think we can make space for it. Um, and then we should probably sign off for the day. Folks should read the book. Yeah, I just want to say thanks so much to everyone. Sorry for kind of talking so much and not getting to that third question over there. And again, Liberty, Carlos, again, thanks so much for hosting this. Carlos, thanks for the kind words and being here today. I really appreciate it. And, and of course, the translation work you're doing, I, I can't thank y'all enough. So thanks for having me and, and let me kind of jabber on a little too long. Appreciate it. No, thank you, Sander. And thank you also, Liberty and Firestorm for the space. I think, uh, yeah. My recommendation is that this book is something that must be read. I, I encourage everybody to, to read this book, to get it in any way. But if you can get it in Firestorm, that would be better. And, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I, I really, really enjoyed it. I think it's a, it's a, it's a good journey and it, it tells you a lot of stuff that I think needs to be said. So, yeah, just that. Thank you, Sander, for the confidence also uh, for inviting me here. It's my pleasure. And, uh, yeah, thank you all. All right, folks. Thanks to everybody who stuck it out with us. And uh, we will look forward to continuing this conversation again someday. Uh, if, if either of y'all are ever in our region, would love to host you um, for an in-person conversation. But for now, we'll end it and uh, have a great evening. <laughs>